You know, a few years ago, there was a movie that came out on Netflix called Army of the Dead. You may have heard of it. Dave Bautista was in the movie. And WWE did a promotion with them. Netflix actually sponsored a match. If you remember, WrestleMania Backlash was the pay-per-view two years ago. And on that show, Damian Priest and The Miz had a lumberjack match. And the lumberjacks in that match were zombies. Because, again, it was tied in with the movie. The movie had zombies in it. So we had zombies all over the ringside area. And if you remember how that match ended, it ended with The Miz and John Morrison being eaten by zombies. I wished when that match was over that I had been eaten. But it was The Miz and Morrison who got eaten by zombies. It was pure garbage. Absolutely terrible. But at least WWE got a great payday out of it, or at least I hope they did. Now, I didn't see any of that payday money, so I don't give a fuck. But, hey, I'm sure they got paid nicely for it, right? Supposedly, they got a million dollars earlier this year for the Mountain Dew pitch black match that we got at the Royal Rumble. So you occasionally see these sponsored matches. Tonight, I hope Tony Khan got paid very well by the people responsible for this Texas Chainsaw Massacre game. For those who don't know, coming out on Friday, Texas Chainsaw Massacre game, they had a Texas Chainsaw Massacre death match between Jeff Jarrett and Jeff Hardy. And when it was over, I wasn't sure exactly what the fuck I had just watched. But the moment that they announced this match, and we didn't know anything about the rules of this match, we knew that there was going to be a tie-in to the promotion of this new game. But when they announced it, I just thought to myself, I said, wait a minute, you're putting Jeff Hardy in a death match. That sounds like a very bad idea. Jeff Hardy just being in the ring at all, frankly, is a very bad idea. But you're going to put Jeff Hardy in a death match. Okay, so that's, that's interesting. But we didn't know the rules or exactly what would be involved. And I expected some degree of, of, of goof, goofiness here. But when it was over... Not only did we have the expected goofiness and all the weapons and we had blood, fake blood, all this stuff, but we had, how are you going to have a Texas Chainsaw Massacre match without Leatherface? There he is, everybody. We heard the sound of a chainsaw and out came Leatherface and I had flashbacks to RoboCop in WCW. Believe it or not, the man who RoboCop saved was actually on the show tonight. Sting was on the show tonight, but there was no RoboCop. Instead, we got Leatherface coming down to the ring with a chainsaw. And it's too bad, really. It really is too bad. Because up to that point in the show, there were some pretty strong angles for All In to build up the show at Wembley Stadium, which is less than two weeks away. They have less than two weeks to really build up the supposed biggest show in wrestling history. The supposed biggest show, it will literally be the biggest show in AEW history. And they had some pretty strong angles on this show. They had an excellent promo. In-ring segment with MJF and Adam Cole. That was easily the best thing on the entire show. Better than anything else that we saw tonight. That promo that MJF cut in the middle of the ring was exactly what they needed to do to build up that main event for the AW World Championship. He went out there, he gave us some more of his backstory, he explained why that match at All In, why that match at Wembley Stadium in front of all those people was so important to him, what it meant to him to be in that main event, why it was so important that he keep that championship. It was exactly what they needed to do. It was perfect. And then after that, when we got this garbage, it was all downhill. From the point of this death match, Everything else that came after it, literally, like the show went off a cliff, hit a few rocks on the way down, exploded upon impact. That's what happened here from that point forward in the show. I don't know whose bright idea it was, by the way, to give us that death match and a Britt Baker match back to back. <laughs> what a wonderful idea that was. It was all downhill from there. So this show tonight was not a lost cause, but my God. You know, and it's not even that I hate the sports entertainment stuff. I really don't. There, there's plenty of sports entertainment shit in WWE and that we've even had here in AEW. There's been a lot of silliness in AEW. Some silliness is fine. It can be entertaining. What I have an issue with is bad sports entertainment, which is what we got here in that match. And I never like Leatherface anyway, so fuck that guy. 
weakest of all the fucking horror movie villains. This is your AEW Dynamite review for Wednesday, August 16th, 2023. I am the Solomon Monster. Like and subscribe. 350 likes is the goal for Be the Booker. We should easily hit that tonight. I want 400, though. I want at least 400. You can do that for me. After what I sat through tonight with that match, the least you could do is just get me to 400. For God's sakes, please, please, you can do that. Uh, super chats are open. You have a brand new seven dollar uh, super chat as well. Thank you to Steve for his uh, help in that. The brand new seven dollar CM Punk banned from Collision super chat that is now available. You too can now be banned from AEW Collision. I wish I was banned from AEW Dynamite tonight. Channel memberships are open as well for those of you who may wish to join. You may do so. Let's talk about dynamite. And I got a couple of news and notes I want to weave into the show here. Some news on Darby Allen, a little bit of news on Hikaru Shida. So we'll get into all that. Still wondering what it was that I watched before. It was one of those nights. Kind of reminds me of when Rey Mysterio got his eyeball popped out. Remember that horror show, Extreme Rules? Remember that pandemic stream? We've had some moments together. Dynamite tonight opened with Orange Cassidy defending the AEW International Championship. And we actually got some clarity on that tonight as well. There you go. There's our first one. Banned from Collision. Tuxedo T Servo, congratulations. You are officially banned from Collision. You can turn around and go home. They don't want you here. You're done. You're finished. Goodbye. Orange Cassidy has opened many an episode of Dynamite. We've seen numerous international title defenses on this show from this man. Oddly enough, we are not getting an international title defense on the one show where you would have expected Look it the most. Richie Rich over here dropping all this money on me. Hey, I just want you to know, I think you rock. I don't mean the rock, a rock, you rock. And I just wanted you to know that. Hey, Chris Jester just dropped a $100 super chat to get us going here on the Dynamite stream. Much better than anything we saw in that Texas Chainsaw Massacre match. Chris, thank you very much. No message, just showing some love. A $100 super chat. Chris, thank you very much. You are officially better than Dynamite tonight. I salute you, sir. Wheeler Yuta was the one challenging for the international championship tonight. Yuta hit Cassidy with an early suicide dive. Cassidy came back with a suplex on the floor. They end up on the ramp. Wheeler Yuta gives Orange Cassidy a pile driver on the ramp. They make their way back down to the ring, and when they get into the ring, Cassidy busts out a beach break heading into the picture in picture. So, yes, a pile driver on the ramp. And just like that, Orange Cassidy makes his comeback, and it's a transition into a commercial break. They don't make those pile drivers like they used to. Hey, Brian, Musha, you are hereby banned from Collision. There's not going to be anybody left by the time we're done tonight. <laughs> there's not going to be a roster left. Everybody's going to be banned. Everybody's going to be told to turn around and go home. You're not even getting paid. During the split screen break, Wheeler Yuta, he was working over Cassidy's leg with an Indian deathlock. After the break, Cassidy started to mount a comeback. He went to the top. Yuta cut him off with a kick, dropped him with a superplex. Yuta hit a top rope splash, only got a near fall. Cassidy went for a spinning DDT, but his leg gave out on him. And he caught Yuta with a Michinoku driver for a near fall, and then hit the spinning DDT on the second try, since the first time didn't work out for him, but he got it on the second attempt. So as Cassidy set up for the orange punch, John Moxley and Claudio Castagnoli, they come out of the crowd. Cassidy hits a paradigm shift in the orange punch, but he was too beat up to make the cover, and Yuta got a near fall with a seatbelt cradle. Cassidy countered a sunset flip attempt with a cradle of his own, and I believe he was holding on to his jeans for added leverage, and he was able to secure the victory and retain the international championship. Uh, good opener. 
standard uh, standard stuff here from Orange Cassidy. Usually he's good, or at least a good match, if not a very good match, to open these shows. This was no different. So immediately after the match, Moxley and Claudio, they jump into the ring to attack OC. Best friends run down to the ring to make the save. They quickly get overwhelmed. So we hear the music for the Lucha Bros. And here comes Penta and Ray Phoenix. They've got Alex Abrahantes with them, and they are in no great rush to come down to the ring. Even though the best friends are getting the hell beaten out of them inside the ring, Penta and Ray Phoenix, they're playing to the crowd. They're taking their time. This reminded me of when Jeff Hardy made his big comeback, and he, or maybe it was his debut, and he was coming out to make the save for his brother Matt. But before he could save his brother, got to dance. So they weren't dancing, but they took their time on the way down. They got into the ring, and uh, but I, sh I should mention this, actually. So there was another Triple Mania show uh, this past weekend. There have been uh, a few Triple Manias so far this year. Now, I believe it was the previous one. There was a match between uh, Penta and QT Marshall, and QT Marshall beat Penta. So this time, I believe it was a four-way, and QT once again beat Penta. He's got Penta's number down in Mexico. Fucking QT Marshall. He, he goes to Mexico. It's like when Hulk Hogan went to Japan. It's unbelievable. But at the end of the match, the reason that Penta lost is because he ripped the mask off. And he protected his face, and he got rolled up. We literally just saw that, we just saw that finish on Dynamite last week. So not even a week later, poor Penta once again gets his mask ripped off. So someone has to do something here for Penta. Because almost every single match that this guy has, his mask gets ripped off. It's like his kryptonite. So I, I suggest either he wears multiple masks, or perhaps he can take some masking tape, maybe duct tape. He can wrap it around the mask. I mean, he might choke himself to death, but he's got to do something. Because that was the second time in less than a week this fucker had his mask ripped off. Anyway, Moxley and Claudio, they went and got chairs. Eddie Kingston's. Music hits. Everybody goes crazy. We have not seen Eddie Kingston in several weeks. He has been living it up in Japan. He has been having the time of his life, living his best life. Truly, Eddie Kingston has been a huge fan of Japanese wrestling uh, for basically his entire life. And so for him to be able to go over there and to work Cork and Hall and to become a champion and go to Ribera and get the jacket and get to meet Toshiaki Kawada, his idol, his hero. I mean, he looked like he was marking out like he's never marked out before. It has been truly one of the best stories of the year to follow in pro wrestling. So now Eddie is back. He's back in the States. He comes out, and Claudio comes out to go after him, so they, he kind of tackles him on the ramp. Uh, at that point, after they uh, wrestled into the ring, the Blackpool Combat Club, they bailed. Kingston took the microphone. He said, Wembley Stadium, boys. All in, boys. It's us against you and whoever you can find in a stadium stampede match. So I guess Meltzer... Now, Meltzer didn't say stadium stampede, but he did mention the multi-man match. So I guess Meltzer's uh, report was true. We are, in fact, getting a multi-man match. It's going to be six on six. We found out later in the show. So the Blackpool Combat Club has to find three additional people to partner with. It's going to be six on six. Uh, I would imagine it'll be more in the vein of Anarchy in the Arena uh, than Stadium Stampede, although Anarchy in the Arena basically was Stadium Stampede, only it didn't have the taped elements to it. Uh, it was literally in the arena with music playing in the background. That's basically what it's going to be, uh, a live-action version of Stadium Stampede. I really would have preferred Eddie in a singles match on this show against either Moxley or Claudio. And I would imagine Tony Khan is going to want to save that match with Claudio for a Ring of Honor pay-per-view. Uh, that probably would have been the match on the Death Before Dishonor show, but Eddie was in Japan. It was, you know, that's why Pac ended up getting that spot. Uh, actually, Pac got the spot after Mark Briscoe then got hurt. So it was just this whole situation where Tony Khan had to find a match for that pay-per-view and he did Pac and Claudio and then what happened? Pac got hurt. That's why Pac is not going to be at all in. Which sucks by the way because I'm sure he would have ended up on that card and uh, I'm sure nobody is more bummed out than he is. But Tony Khan probably wants to save that match for a Ring of Honor show. I just think it's lazy 
It's just lazy. It's lazy booking to just throw everybody. It's not even, you think multi-man match. You think trios, right? Because they love doing trios matches. Six on six. It's like, we don't know what to do with all these guys, but we want to get them all on the show. So fuck it. We'll just throw them all in a match. We'll call it Stadium Stampede and we'll just let them run amok. The problem is we just had a parking lot brawl on Rampage last week. We had blood and guts only a few weeks ago. A few months ago, we had Anarchy in the arena. We already we see so many matches like this so often on these shows in this company that I, I'm kind of numb to it at this point. And I'm just disappointed. Now, I'm sure these guys are going to go out there and it's going to be fun. I mean, given who's involved, it probably will end up being fun. But I was really hoping we would get either a singles match or even, even just a, a tag match. Maybe if it was Cassidy and Kingston against Moxley and Claudio, that would have made sense. Uh, but the bigger thing is no international title defense on the biggest international show that this company will ever do. For all of the times we have seen this guy, including tonight, defending that championship week after week after week, if he hasn't hit 30 already, he's closing in on 30 title defenses. How are you not going to defend the international title at Wembley Stadium? How? It's just stupid. I think that's just uh, ridiculous myself. Hey, Justin Logue, you are here by band from Collision. Thank you for the seven bucks. Boy, we're building up uh, quite a roster over here. We'll let some of these run through. I put a pause on them. So let's uh, give a thank Look you to get Richie Rich over here. Bobby's World and Lady Fire Panda for the hey, gifted membership. I just want you to know. Oh, my I goodness. Think you rock. I don't mean the rock, a rock, you rock. And I just wanted you to know that. Oh, man. Chris Jester back again with a $100 super chat. The second one of the night. He did not know how to post a message the first time. <laughs> so he posted a message the second time. Just a small thanks, he says. And uh, wait till all in from Minnesota to third row, smack dab in the middle. Nice big solo sign, plus many other things. Solo freaks make us viral. How about that? Chris is going to be at Wembley Stadium. You know, every time uh, WWE goes to Saudi Arabia, my boy Fawaz, shout out to Fawaz, uh, always, always represents the podcast and he comes up with these signs you can't miss it right the logo it's just it's it's beautiful beautiful the the positioning the seat that he's able to get it's awesome always representing the podcast so chris is apparently going to represent the podcast at wembley stadium in two weeks although after after this review tonight i wouldn't be surprised if tony Khan personally dove into the crowd and ripped the sign out of your hands but chris thank you very much man that's awesome and i'm going to keep an eye out for it for sure we will all keep an eye out at Wembley Stadium. I want to see those solo signs at All In. I mean, if I can't be there, you guys can represent me. So there you go. Chris, thank you, man. I, you're blowing me away tonight. I appreciate that. So yesterday, we were told yesterday, Jim Ross sat down for a special interview at Daly's Place. They were outside in Daly's Place in Jacksonville, and JR sat down with Kenny Omega. And they aired footage uh, of this segment, and Ross asks Omega, how could you ever do business with somebody like Don Callis? And Omega talks about how he's like Uncle Don, he calls him, and said he was always there when he was growing up. He didn't have many friends, and, you know, Don was always there for him. He talked about how he just wants to move on from everything that's happened, and he doesn't want to be consumed by revenge. Ross brought up Kanosuke Takeshita, and Omega said that Takeshita reminded him of himself, and he said that Callus choosing someone younger, stronger, and faster hurt him. And Omega said that he was going to take Don's cash cow away from him. And I like they spliced in footage of uh, their previous encounter. They had at least one match back in DDT many years ago. So we got to see a young Takeshita. Uh, in the ring with a much younger Kenny Omega. I, I actually didn't know about those uh, matches from DDT. So that was very cool that they spliced footage of that in here. So Don Callis suddenly shows up. I guess somebody tipped him off that they would be doing this interview at Daly's Place. You got a mole 
somewhere in AEW. See, CM Punk was right. So Don Callis shows up and he tells JR that Omega has so many insecurities, they might need to turn this segment into a three-hour show. Jay White and Juice Robinson suddenly attack Kenny Omega. White slammed the metal pole over Omega's back. Takeshita showed up. He joined in the beatdown. They took a uh, two-by-four long wooden board, and they smashed that over Omega's back. They were choking him out with some cables. They cut back to the announcers live, and they're uh, taken aback by this heinous attack. And then we go back to outside the hospital, we're told. We see Hangman Adam Page who is standing in front of an ambulance in front of what is supposed to be the hospital where Kenny Omega is inside. And he's got a beer in his hand. And here I thought he no longer had a drinking problem. He said that if you're going to start a beatdown, you got to finish it. you got to do it the right way. He said Omega would not be alone at All In. He said that it's going to be Kenny Omega, it's going to be Hangman Page, and it's going to be Kota Ibushi. Look at Richie Rich over Holy here shit. dropping and Chris all this money. is going to join you. them hey, too. I just want you to know, I think you rock. I think Chris should get in the ring I don't with mean them too. The rock, a rock, you rock. And I just wanted you to know that. Holy shit! Oh my god! You hear that? It's ninety thousand people on their feet for Chris Jester with his third. Hundy bomb of the night. Oh my God, Chris, you are uh, you are a beast, my friend. The show was so bad tonight. I decided to go all Toronto and take over the show. How about having a legend section for Be the Booker? Minnesota is AWA. Let's get the Crusher and Baron in the book. Baron von Raschke, right? The Claw, the Claw. He's looking good. I saw I saw the I saw the uh the Baron here in his uh later years. And uh, the Baron is a legend. I I would consider that. I would consider. It. Not really a crusher guy, but I guess if you're from the uh, Twin Cities, I guess you would be. Got uh, got to get Nick Bockwinkle in there too. Hey Chris man, thank you. I don't know what else to say. You're you're uh you're really going above and beyond tonight, my friend. Man. So, just like that, poof, throws it out there. It's going to be Omega, it's going to be Hangman, and it's going to be Kota Ibushi taking on Bullet Club Gold. And they're going to finish the beatdown that they started. Security showed up. One guy showed up, and he told Hangman, he goes, Sir, you can't be drinking on hospital grounds. And he didn't know that. And so Hangman chugged the rest of his beer, and he handed the empty can to the security guy to end the segment. I would be drinking, too, if I were Hangman Page after the events of the last several days. Yeah, I'd have a six-pack, and I'd be downing those beers, too. So there you go. There's another There's another Meltzer report confirmed, because I believe it was Dave who was the first person to suggest or uh, report that that was likely going to be the match at All In. So what are the rules here? I need somebody to clarify the rules here for me. When it comes to uh, when it comes to Meltzer, is Meltzer accurate this week? Just this week, and then next week he's not accurate again. Is that how it works? Is that pretty much how it works? So basically, Dave is always wrong until he's right. Is that basically is that basically how it works? Apparently, those are the rules. I just want to make sure I have that right. So unfortunately, Kenny Omega is in a trios match at the biggest AEW show of all time. And that is a fail. But I am not going to beat up on Tony Khan too much for it. It sucks. It's disappointing. But it's not entirely his fault. Because there were reports that there was a match considered between Kenny Omega and Brian Danielson. Not that that would have been the final match, but that they were at least thinking about doing Omega and Danielson at All In. Well, Omega got his, or Danielson rather, got his arm broken, right? Not a whole hell of a lot you can do about that. You can thank Okada for that. So Danielson is out. And I'm sure he would have played a big role on this show, whether it was against Omega or somebody else. Nigel McGuinness even said that the one thing that would get him to come out of retirement for this show would be a match with Brian Danielson. 
So that fell to the wayside. Kenny Omega and Will Ospreay, part three. This would have been the time and the place to do it. And I don't have any doubt in my mind that if Tony Khan had his way, he would have wanted Omega Osprey 3 on his show in front of 80,000 people in Osprey's home country. And it would have been cool. You would have had the first match of the year in Tokyo. You would have had the second match of the year in Toronto. And you would have had the third match of the year in London. But New Japan Pro Wrestling very likely put the kibosh on that because they want to do the match, I believe, at Wrestle Kingdom next year. What's Tony Khan going to say? What can he say? If that's the match that New Japan wants, then that's the match that New Japan is going to get. The last thing Tony Khan wants to do is rock the boat and piss off New Japan. Not his fault. But Omega being in a trios match and not a, a singles match is disappointing. I would have even settled for him and Takeshita on this show. But they'll probably do it a week later in Chicago at All Out because don't forget, they have a second pay-per-view to book. We only have one match official for that show. The majority of that show will not be booked until after All In. There'll be less than a week to get matches on the card for that All Out. The only match we know is Darby Allen challenging Luchasaurus for the TNT Championship. And I was kind of hoping it would be him and Christian for the title. Uh, but we're actually getting him and Christian, I guess, non-title on Collision this Saturday. So I assume it's Darby and the Dinosaur at, at All Out. As far as Ibushi, look, I like Kota Ibushi. I was glad to see him finally make his AEW debut in Blood and Guts. But objectively speaking, you can't look at Ibushi's performance in that match and look at it as anything but a disappointment. And a lot of people were going after him for his physical appearance. Yeah, he was softer. He wasn't in the same physical shape that he has traditionally been in. I believe because he's still hurt. I don't have a doubt in my mind that he is still hurt. And I think that has a lot to do with it. I don't think that he can train upper body anyway the way that he used to. I still believe that he's probably having shoulder issues. And that may have something to do with his physical appearance. But beyond his physical appearance, like he didn't do much. He just, you know, there, there just wasn't much to it in blood and guts. So I'm hoping that we get something a little bit closer to the Ibushi of old at All In. And it's not just him showing up and mailing it in. Because Kota Ibushi tagging in front of, you know, 80-something thousand people with Kenny Omega should be a big deal. But uh, people aren't wrong. The ones who were disappointed with his, his performance in Blood and Guts, yeah, we didn't really get to see much out of him. Hopefully we get to see more at all in. Hopefully it's a different story then. Now back to the ring. Don Callis is in the ring. I know this before they even show it because I hear boos. And they cut to the ring, and I see Don Callis. Actually, I saw a bald head. I saw, I saw like a reflection off of a bald head. I said, that must be Don Callis. And then I saw that scar. That is a hell of a scar. I got to say that. that I mean, and of all the places, too, like, pff, right there, like right there, that's a pretty bad spot for a scar. But you know what? In a way, it's kind of cool, I guess, you know? Kind of like a battle scar. So he's waiting on the arrival of Chris Jericho, because last week Jericho said that he was going to have an answer for Don Callis as far as whether or not he would join the Don Callis family. So Jericho comes down. Callis tells him he was sorry about what happened last week. Jericho said that the members of the Jericho Appreciation Society made him realize that he should change a few things. Because remember, they all walked out on him last week. Sammy Guevara was the only one. He was the last one in the ring with Jericho. And he said, you know, basically, maybe, maybe I'll be here for you. But everybody walked out on him. Jericho told Callis that, uh, I don't join factions, I create them. But then, he said, my answer is yes. Yes, he will join the Don Callis family. He said the JAS members walking out on him made him realize that he needs to get back to his roots. He said he needed to be aligned with a man who is just as low as he is. Callis hugged him. He said that, uh, you know what, we don't need to waste any more time on these rubes. Let's go out and celebrate. He went to go leave the ring. He said they could go drink Broadway dry. Jericho stopped Callis and he pointed out because in the ring in the corner there was a an easel set up with some sort of uh, photo or painting or something we couldn't tell because it was underneath the tarp. And Jericho said, wait a minute, what's that? And Callis tried to dismiss it and say, oh yeah, it's nothing, don't worry about it. Jericho said, no, 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 we're going to celebrate. I want to know what's underneath. 
So he goes over, he uncovers the painting, and underneath is a painting of Don Callis holding Jericho's severed head in his hand. He's holding his, his head by the hair. And Jericho asks if Callis thought that he was going to say no. Is that why you had this painting made? Did you think I was going to say no to you? And Jericho asked if Callus was going to have him uh, assassinated all over a business decision. What is this? Callus claimed the artist just screwed up. Jericho said, look, I've known you since 1989, and I know when you're lying to me. He called him a scumbag, lowlife. He told Callus to be honest with him for the first time in his life. Callus said, okay, you're right. I didn't think you were going to say yes. I thought you were going to come out tonight. You were going to reject me. Callis said that he thought Jericho would say no due to his massive ego. And he said that it's always been all about Jericho, and thus he assumed that Jericho would make a very stupid decision. Now, this, this was all a bit of a reach here, okay? Because for weeks now, Don Callis has been parading around with Jericho, kissing his ass and sucking up to him. Jericho has given no indication up to this point. Not even, like, hinting, like, I'm probably going to say no, but I don't know, I'll consider it. Like, that, you know, at least in that situation, I can understand it. Or if there were other segments with Jericho, right, that Callus could have seen on television where it looked like Jericho was having doubts about linking up with him. But there really hasn't been anything like that. So for Callus to just assume that Jericho was going to say no, they, did, they wanted to swerve us, basically. Because most people probably thought, as I did, that Jericho was going to say no. So let's swerve everybody by having Jericho say yes. So again, it was a bit of a reach here that Callus would go through all this trouble, and then on a dime, here he is insulting Jericho, talking about his massive ego. Guy's been sucking up to Jericho for a month. <laughs> all of a sudden, I didn't actually think you were going to say yes to me. So Callus said that in a business full of egomaniacs, Jericho is the best. He said Jericho doesn't deserve to be part of his family. Jericho said Callus wasn't even in the business three years ago, and nobody cared. He said Callus had no friends and had messed up every personal relationship he's ever had in his life. He called Callus an asshole. That is the uh, second time, by the way, in the last week that we have heard the word asshole uttered, uncensored, on a wrestling show. We actually had that on SmackDown the other week. Callus slapped Jericho across the face. So Jericho grabbed him by his collars, and he pushed him back into the corner. Kanosuke Takeshita showed up with a chair. Jericho saw him coming, though, and he cut him off. When who should come from out of nowhere, lower the boom on Chris Jericho, but Will Ospreay. Would you look at that? Another rumor. Another confirmed rumor that we heard about a week ago. Turned out to be true. Will Ospreay attacks Jericho. He might have been on the same flight with Eddie Kingston, over from Japan, back to the U.S. Now that the G1 is over, right, they became available. Ospreay got a chair. He hit Jericho in the head with it. Jericho did get his hands up. Jericho started bleeding from the forehead. Ospreay and Takeshita, they held up Jericho for Callus to take the painting. Looked like it was framed, frame painting. Smashed it over Jericho's head. Sammy Guevara ran out with a baseball bat which caused Callis, Osprey, and Takeshita to flee the ring, and Guevara checked on Jericho. So they did the, uh, the little swerve with Jericho there, but in the end, as predicted, he does not join the Don Callis family. Now, later in the show, there was a segment where Jericho was interviewed by Rene. And Jericho had dried blood all over his head, and he said that the match between him and Osprey, he goes, you didn't have to attack me to get the match. And he claims that the match with him and Osprey was supposed to happen at the Tokyo Dome back in 2021, were it not for all of the COVID lockdowns, uh, which I was not aware of, that the plan had been for Jericho to wrestle Osprey, which I assume is the truth. And he challenged Osprey to a match at Wembley Stadium. He told Osprey that he opened hell and the Ocho is coming for him. So we are getting a babyface Chris Jericho, who may not be a babyface in London, given who he's wrestling. Jericho is a babyface going one-on-one -on -one with Will Ospreay. Now, in this segment here tonight on this show, Ospreay was the heel because he's associated with Don Callis. Jericho is the babyface. That dynamic may be flipped 
in two weeks in Wembley Stadium. This is a match that we have not seen before. So that's that's one plus. It's not a match that's been done before. It hasn't been done to death. And as I said the other day on the podcast, of all the opponents that Jericho could be in the ring with, and not that Jericho can't go out there and have a good match, right? It's hit or miss. Whatever, whatever that match was he had with uh, Adam Cole, for example, that was a miss. He's got it in him to still have good matches, but he's getting older. He's not in the shape that he used to be in. He's not the same in-ring performer that he used to be. Father time is undefeated. It is no different with Chris Jericho. But if Jericho had to handpick an opponent to give him the chance to have the best possible match that he could have, Will Ospreay is that person. You cannot find a better person than Will Ospreay. So this may end up being the best Jericho match that we've seen in years. But for Will Ospreay, again, disappointing for what they could have done. Now, I understand that Ospreay is not even part of the AEW roster. He's not even an AEW guy. But they've used him before. You're at Wembley Stadium. He is one of the best performers in the entire world. You want him on that show. And if you couldn't do him and Omega... You could have, now again, Pac got hurt. I would have even loved to have seen Pac and Osprey over Jericho and Osprey. But if you were going to have him on the show, unfortunately the Omega thing fell through. So they went with Osprey and Jericho. Not the ideal opponent for Osprey. I would have rather have seen him in the ring with any number of other people. This is what we're getting. I do think that it may end up being the best Jericho match we've had in years. But again, it's just another situation where, for what should have been the biggest possible card that Tony Khan could put together, due to a combination of just his booking decisions and injuries and politics and just the way things sort of fell, we're not getting the strongest card I feel like we could be getting. And that's disappointing for a show they are billing as the biggest show of all time. And they've already... Officially passed 80,000 tickets, right? They'll they'll probably be over 81,000 in the next few days. There is this feeling of disappointment. I'm not one of these people that will sit here and tell you, man, this all-in card, this card sucks. It doesn't suck. But when you look at some of the matches, it's like, eh. I shouldn't be sitting here going, eh, for supposedly the biggest show of all time. That's the problem. We got a Jack Perry video. And in the video, he talked about beating Rob Van Dam on the show last week. He said he's going to be on Dynamite next week to officially retire the FTW championship, which caught Taz off guard on commentary. And then Taz said, uh, let's move on from this. (laughs) Okay. See, now I'm a Jack Perry fan. I think we need to be doing more of that. Yes, let's let's go ahead and retire some title. We'll start with the FTW title. After that, maybe we'll look at the TNT title, the way things have been going. Darby Allen, speaking of TNT title, we'll talk about this in a second, but Darby Allen was on the show tagging with Nick Wayne, taking on the Gates of Agony from Ring of Honor. The Gates attacked them as they were making their entrance. Swerve Strickland and A.R. Fox, who were wrestling Sting and Darby at Wembley in two weeks, they came out on stage and took a seat on the ramp to watch the following match. The heels worked over Nick Wayne during the split screen break. After the break, Wayne got the hot tag, Darby... And Nick Wayne, they combined for a crucifix bomb super kick combo that got them a near fall. Gates of Agony hit a demolition-style decapitation elbow for a near fall. Nick Wayne hit a springboard cutter, and then he and Darby, they both climb up to the top rope, same turnbuckle. Climbed up to the top at the same time, and then Wayne hit Tangaloa on the floor with a moonsault at the same time that Darby came off the top in the ring with a coffin drop to Cone, and he pinned him to win the match. After the match, the Mogul affiliates, they all surrounded the ring, but they were interrupted by Sting. And it wasn't a picture of Sting, it was the real Sting. He was up on the Titan Tron, he was up on the big, what would you call it? I guess we shouldn't call it the Titan Tron. What should we call it? Should we call it the, uh, the, the well, it's Punk's company, apparently. We'll call it the Punk Tron, because apparently he runs this company. So up on the Punktron was Sting. And Sting said that he's directing a movie. And he tells A.R. Fox, this is for you. He says he has eyes on 
or he told he tells him that he should have eyes in the back of his head 24 7 because they have a coffin match coming up in nine days at wembley nine days nine days everybody we zoom out sting is sitting on a couch somewhere we which is funny because i actually have that's one of the super chats we have stay right with the super chat we have sting sitting in the recliner watching the show we almost got that tonight. He was sitting on the couch, but they zoom out and sitting next to him, kidnapped, is Prince Nana. Because Prince Nana was not out there with the mogul affiliates. The reason is because Sting captured him. And Nana tells Sting, actually, we are 11 days away. Actually, it's like one of those people on Twitter. When you post something, you get a little detail wrong. Actually says, actually, they have 11 days to go until all in. Sting says uh, all he's got to say is, it's showtime. And Sting screams in Prince Nana's face. Nana runs off scared. Sting then sits back, and he's acting all psychotic. He starts calling for Nana. He goes, Nana, Nana. And then he lapses into the Nana, Nana, hey, hey, goodbye song. <laughs> like he's losing his mind. And then he just calmly, he's, you know, talking about how he wants Prince Nana to come back because he needs somebody to talk to. This was the closest that we have gotten to Joker Sting here during this AEW run. I always felt like people blindly hated on Joker Sting. I, I didn't mind Joker Sting. I actually liked it. It was different. You know, he was trying to change it up a little bit. I enjoyed the Joker Sting run from TNA. And, of course, that segment with the, with the Crow in uh, Eric Bischoff's office. Kind of a classic uh, impact segment. But what I wanted to talk about with uh, Darby, I mentioned the TNT title. Uh, Darby Allen was on this week's AEW Control Center. They have this video they do every week called the AEW Control Center. And he was in character for it. So it was a promo. But I want to read this to you. This is what he had to say about the TNT title. He says, I'm going to be honest when I say this. To me, the TNT Championship used to mean something. And within the last year, I felt like it lost all value. I remember the people that used to hold it. Guys like Cody Rhodes and guys like Brody Lee, myself. Back then, it meant something. Now, it's like a hot potato. Honestly, I feel like it's lost its value. So when I say that it all out, I want to put some respect back on that championship's name. I mean every word of that. Because you have a guy like Christian Cage, for example, walking around and saying he's the champion. Like, come on, we're not stupid. You're just, you're just wasting people's time. That championship means more than that. And then you got a dinosaur as the champion that never defends it. What are we doing here? So I put out the challenge to Christian Cage. Enough talking. If you think you're a champion, start acting like one. I'm going to kick your ass and it all out. I'm going to take that championship. I don't care. If you think it's yours, I don't care if you think it's Luchasaurus's. It doesn't matter because at All Out, it's going to be mine. And I'm going to put respect back on that championship's name. Now, as I mentioned, he's wrestling Christian on Collision this Saturday. And then he'll be challenging for the title probably against the Dinosaur in Chicago at All Out. Now, those comments may have been in character as part of the show and trying to get people hyped up for the match with Christian. But that is a worked shoot, if I have ever heard one. It may have been in character, but I sensed no lies in anything the man was saying. And he probably meant every word of it, too, even though he was in character. Uh, there was nothing he said there that was wrong, which is sad, because the TNT Championship did used to mean something. It had value. It did. You have a world championship. And you always want to have a strong secondary title. Like in WWE for so many years with the Intercontinental title, there were plenty of guys who were put in a position to be the Intercontinental Champion. And for them, it was a stepping stone. It was a stepping stone to the world title. Something bigger. Randy Savage was an Intercontinental Champion. The Ultimate Warrior was an Intercontinental Champion. Bret Hart was a champion. Shawn Michaels was a champion. The Rock, Steve Austin, Chris Jericho. Right? You can find plenty of examples. But not everybody who had that title went on to become a world champion. Right? Razor Ramon never went on to become a world champion. Mr. Perfect never went on to become a world champion. The Honky Tonk Man, thank fucking God, never went on to become a world champion. But it meant something. Of course, 
up until Gunther got a hold of it. It hadn't meant anything in a very long time. But in AEW, that's what the TNT title was. And for Cody, because of that stupid stipulation, when he lost and couldn't wrestle for the world title, that was his world title. And that's part of why it felt like it had value, because Cody was a big name in AEW who couldn't go after the top prize, so he made that his top prize. That's part of the reason why that championship meant something. When Brody Lee beat him for it, he squashed him. People were shocked. People were not expecting that. It was like their version of Brock beating John Cena at SummerSlam in 2014. It was very impactful. And then Cody got the belt back. I, I will tell you that that championship, in my opinion, has not really meant much of anything since Cody lost it to Sammy in the ladder match early last year. And that, I believe, was Cody's last match. He had that ladder match on Dynamite against Sammy Guevara. That, honestly, was the last time that that championship really meant something. Samoa Joe had the belt last year, but it was brief. I think he had it twice. Um, but it was too short to really mean anything. He's had the Ring of Honor television title for a lot longer. Um, but what does the Ring of Honor television title really mean? I mean, come on, give me a break. So Darby is not wrong when he makes those comments. It would be nice for the TNT title to get some of that shine back. Uh, you look at me from, from the time Sammy won it, Scorpio Sky, Wardlow, and his aborted push. Uh, it just, it, it's become... Just one of those things, just a prop on the show that gets bounced back and forth between people and doesn't really help the people that are holding it. Look at Austin Theory in the U.S. title on SmackDown. You're going to tell me the U.S. title did anything for Austin Theory? If anything, Austin Theory brought down the U.S. title the way that he was booked. That should not happen. That should not be the case. Especially on a show like that where you have Roman Reigns. You have a guy who has a stranglehold on the top title. It's like the Cody situation all over again. Roman has the belt, right? So forget it. Pretend that doesn't even exist. Because nobody else is going to get their hands on it until next year. They should be treating the U.S. title like a top title on that brand. Because everybody else is just basically playing for scraps as long as Roman has it. So what they've done with the U.S. title also is disgusting. It's no different than how Tony Khan has, has booked and treated the TNT title. So there were no lies in what Darby said. And uh, I would put the belt back on Darby. Darby is well-liked. Darby is looked at as a star in that company. And if it were up to me, as much as I've loved this Christian run that he's been on holding that title, if they're going to do a title change, I think Darby is the perfect choice for it. Now we got the latest video that aired with MJF and Adam Cole, who are in the main event at Wembley Stadium in less than two weeks. MJF was standing in front of a steakhouse. Cole showed up, and he asked, what are we doing here? And MJF talked about facing Aussie Open it's the amazing on the pre-show. Jerry Lawler loves Goonthar. Who it is, everybody. All hail Gunthar. It's the mighty one himself. All hail. The mighty Gunthar, Zachariah Sitchin, dropping a $50 Gunthar bomb on us here on a Wednesday night. Hey, Zachariah, thank you, brother. This is good, too, because I'm not going to be here on Friday. So thank you, Zachariah. I appreciate you very much. I'm going to read your super chat a little bit later on. I want to, I want to, Bunch them all together. But Zachariah, thank you very much, man. You're the man. So they're outside this steakhouse, and uh, Cole wants to know, what are we doing here? MJF says, look, we're facing Aussie Open on this pre-show. And he said that we have to get inside their heads. The camera pulled back to reveal an Outback Steakhouse. I don't even remember how long it has been since I have eaten at an Outback Steakhouse, but uh, I have had some good meals there before. So I can't say that it's the finest cuisine that I've ever had, but I don't really think I have any complaints about Outback Steakhouse. I've had some good meals there. So then they showed uh, the two of them eating. Thankfully, they weren't making any disgusting eating noises like I do on the Road to Elite in the uh, Fight Forever game. <laughs> yeah, it's funny. I talked to a few friends who got the game also. And I said to them, how, how often do you play the game? 
because I mean the game just came out not that long ago. You know, end of June. That's not that long ago. They haven't picked up the game in like four or five weeks. <laughs> so I don't know if you guys and look, I I have the game too, and I started doing the Road to Elite stuff, and I I may get back to it, but I don't know. It feels like that game has like no replay value. I mean, you go through it the first time, you play it for a little bit. And it just feels like that game has no replay value. Now, I know they're saving the Stadium Stampede mode as a DLC. And they're doing a Stadium Stampede match at All In in two weeks. If I were them, and maybe this is their plan, if I were them, I would time the release of the Stadium Stampede DLC with All In. Since they're having a Stadium Stampede match there. Uh, that, I think, might breathe new life into the game, but... I don't know. A lot of people that uh, I see online, man, they haven't they haven't been playing the game in weeks. It's like it really had no replay value. And yes, in the cutscenes, you do make disgusting noises as you eat at these various restaurants. It really is quite disgusting. So they cut then to the uh, two of them backstage later on at the arena as the skit continues. We go backstage at the arena. Cole is uh, there with a Crocodile Dundee DVD. He shows up. MJF then shows him footage of two kangaroos fu no, no, fucking fighting. Two kangaroos fighting. Not that other thing. And he says, that's how we're going to win. That's how we're going to beat Aussie Open. And he shows Cole what he calls the kangaroo kick. He's got all of his strategy planned out here. Then they cut to the two of them wearing safari hats. And they were peeking through some production crates. On the other side, they see some unidentified dude. He's flipping out over an inflatable crocodile and some other items that just so happen to be there. Cole and MJF end up uh, coming out from around the production crates, and they give this guy a double clothesline. So now we hear a voice yelling for Cole and MJF to go to his office. And then we get a shot outside of Tony Khan's office. I know this because it says... Tony Khan's office on the door. And we can hear Tony Khan on the other side of the door, and he's yelling at the two of them about, you can't do that. You can't do the double clothesline in the back. You got to keep it in the ring. Eventually, Cole and MJF, they walk out of his office, and MJF says he's going to make Tony regret that in 2024, right? He reminds us about the bidding war of 2024. Tony Khan then walks outside. He's wearing shades. For some reason, I don't know if he's uh, Stevie Wonder or what, what, what exactly is going on here. But he walks outside, he takes the shades off, and he goes, what did you say? And MJF buddies up to him, and Tony then smiles, and he thanks him, and he puts his, awkwardly puts his shades back on and goes back into his office. So poking fun, I guess, at himself, at the fact that uh, apparently he can't keep order in his own locker room. Gee, I wonder. I wonder where that came from. Well, at least he has a sense of humor about it. Now, is he actually going to do something about it? Probably not. It's nice to be self-deprecating if you uh, acknowledge that there are problems, but when you don't take steps to address those problems, that's not good. So now we come back live to the arena. MJF and Cole, they arrive in MJF's Ferrari. They get out. MJF tells Cole, look, I got to go take a dump. And he goes to rush off to the bathroom. Cole looks into the camera. He tells us, I guess we'll see you guys after the commercial break. And he walks off. And just as he walks off, a few seconds later, Roderick Strong shows up. Roddy is there with Matt Taven and Mike Bennett. See, he missed them again. He missed Cole again. So he gets all flustered, and Roddy kicks the car, and then he acts like he broke his foot. After the commercial, we have the in-ring promo segment with MJF and Adam Cole that I talked about here at the beginning of the stream. This here was the highlight of the show. I haven't even gotten to the worst part of the show yet. That's yet to come. But this was the best part of the show. This is where the show peaked. If you turned the show off after this segment, you would have been fine. Because all the, the key promotion for All In, really, pretty much up to this point in the show, you got what you needed. We had a, a Young Bucks FTR uh, face off at the end of the show. Honestly, the buildup for the Young Bucks at FTR has been very paint by numbers, very standard. They don't have to do much because you're taking two teams that are the two, arguably two best teams in the entire world, and you build a match around who is the best team in the world. 
right? I mean, it's it's pretty simple stuff. So if you missed that, you didn't miss anything. But this right here, this was the key. So they get in the ring, and MJF is playing up, winning with the kangaroo kick on the pre-show in two weeks. Crowd starts chanting kangaroo kick. Cole changes the focus from the Aussie Open match to their main event match on that show for the AEW World Championship. And he says that it is the most important match of his life. He talked about how all those months ago, he didn't even know if he would be able to wrestle ever again. His concussion was so serious and the lingering issues that he had from it, he honestly didn't know if he would ever even be able to step back between the ropes, which is true. And now here he is, a part of what will be the biggest main event on the biggest pro wrestling show of all time. Cole said that he's doing it with one of his best friends. He said he's been at the top of every company he's ever worked for. He's had record-breaking title reigns. He said he would solidify his place in AEW by winning at Wembley Stadium. Cole told MJF that he will do anything and everything to win that AEW World Championship, which are words to pay attention to, because you still have to leave open the possibility that all this stuff with Roderick Strong, it's all part of a bigger swerve, and him and Cole are really conspiring together to try to screw MJF out of his championship. It's one of the uh, one of several scenarios that can play out at Wembley, which is one of the things I like about what they're doing here. They want you to think that MJF is going to turn on him, or maybe Cole is going to turn on him. Where does Roddy fit into all this? Uh, they've done a very good job, I think, of keeping people guessing about how this is all going to play out. So MJF said that uh, Cole told a great story, but his was better. And he asked the crowd who was ready for story time with MJF Bebe. And he was thinking back to when he was younger. And part of this, he's already told some of this before. So some of this was uh, repeating things that he's talked about before, but I, I think in the overall picture of what he was trying to do here, uh, it was fine that you know he kind of recalled some of this stuff for a second time. But he mentioned that when he uh, was younger, he was asked to write down his dream opponents. This was his first day of pro wrestling school. Who would your dream opponents in the ring be? And he said the two names he wrote down were Cody Rhodes and Adam Cole. He talked about putting 90,000 miles on his new Dodge Ram truck in 2018, just trying to bust his ass to make a name for himself on the independent scene. And then a little birdie told him that there was going to be a show in Chicago that was going to be the biggest pro wrestling show in decades. And that show was called All In. So he sent an email to Cody. I wonder if that email was sent after the email to William Regal that he talked about in that other promo. Sent an email to Cody. And he promised him that he would not disappoint if he gave him a chance. And Some time went by. Show was getting closer. Finally, he gets a response. From Cody Rhodes telling him that he was all in. And he got to open a pay-per-view that he had no right being on. He may have lost that night, he said, but he managed to turn some heads, one of them being Tony Khan. Khan offered him a contract to a company called All Elite Wrestling. And he made the point that without all in, if there's no all in, there's no MJF. Which is why I thought it was important for him to retell some of these things. Because that was the point that he was making. Right? We have all-in coming up in two weeks. Well, if there was no all-in in the first place, very possible, very likely, he would not be standing here as the world champion right now. So this show is very important to him. It, it means something to him. It has historical significance for him. Now the year is 2023, and he's climbed up the card. He's grown up in front of all of us. He became a generational talent, the devil himself, one of the best, AEW world champion. Now he's looking at the chance to be on a show called All In, and it's against his friend, and it's the biggest opportunity of all time. He says he will be in the main event with a man who on day one was his dream opponent and now is his best friend. This means so much to him, but it doesn't mean everything to him. There's one thing that means everything to him and one thing only, and that is the world champion. Because this is not simply just a title, it's a symbol of his blood, sweat, tears, all the hours of training and studying tape. Also, he could become champion. 
And he is not going to be laying down just because he's Adam Cole's buddy. He loves Cole like a brother, but a win in Wembley Stadium will make him legendary. He's going to win because nobody is on the level of the devil. And again, I like him driving home the point that he has to win at All In because on a show this big, in front of this many people, on this stage, in the main event, he can't go in there and lose. If he wins, his name is etched in the stars forever. Really driving home the importance of this show. It's not just another show. This is so much more than just another show. Something that I don't think, again, the booking of this show really lends itself to. But MJF made that very clear here in his promo, which I think was very important. How important this show is. Cole said, may the best man win. And MJF said, I have a feeling the best man is going to win, and that man is going to be Maxwell Jacob Friedman. Because he's better than Cole, and he knows it. And Cole said, that's interesting, because I'm pretty sure the name of the new champion is... And then he put his fingers up, and everybody said Adam Cole. So they smiled at each other, and they knocked knuckles, and now here comes Aussie Open. And they attack. Cole and MJF, though, they fight back. They called for a double clothesline. They send Mark Davis into the ropes, but he holds on, slips out of the ring. But Kyle Fletcher is still in the corner. He turns around. Davis, though, pulls him out of the ring to safety. So MJF is holding his title up in the air, and he's facing Aussie Open in the aisle. And Adam Cole is now standing behind MJF, and he's crouched down like he's waiting to strike, like he's waiting to throw a super kick as soon as this guy turns around. And finally, MJF turns around, and Cole just stands up. So he didn't see him crouch down. He just stood up. The crowd wants them to hug it out, so they do. Roderick Strong was shown in the back, watching, sitting in a chair, icing his foot from when he kicked the car earlier. Matt Taven and Mike Bennett were standing behind him. This was a money promo here from MJF, as most of his promos on these shows are. Sometimes it can get repetitive. Sometimes there's not a lot of substance to it. Uh, it comes out, he'll, he'll cut you know the typical heel promo and insult the crowd, and it's kind of funny, but then he'll have those promos where he goes, kind of digs down into his history. And he's had several of those, and they're usually very effective. This is the first time, though, he's done one of these promos as a babyface. Now, whether you believe he's actually going to end up being a babyface or not, he is a babyface right now. And we have not had a long, extended promo from him like this as a babyface yet. And it resonated with the crowd. They were with him for the entire thing. But, again, to drive home the importance of this show is so important. Because we're less than two weeks away from... What really, if you think about it, what really should be AEW's WrestleMania 3 or their SummerSlam 92, you know, two shows that are still talked about decades later. That's what this show should be for this company. Is it going to end up being that for AEW? I don't know. There are matches on the show that could live up to the billing, could be all-time classics. I mean, you don't think the Bucks and FTR could go out there and have an all-time classic? Look at the matches they've already had in this company. Now take those two teams and put them in front of a crowd this big. Look at the matches that FTR has had on Collision in the last several weeks. With Bullet Club Gold, with Cole and MJF, you're just magnifying that now, right? So there are matches on that show that could go on to become all-time classics. But it, it still just feels like there's something there's something missing here. But then I also think back to WrestleMania 3, and I say, what is WrestleMania 3 remembered for? Other than the crowd. Two matches. People don't talk about the undercard matches. They don't talk about Billy Jack Haynes in his match. Was it against Hercules? I think he wrestled. They don't talk really much about Roddy Piper against Adrian Adonis or Junkyard Dog against Harley Race or the Hart Foundation and Danny Davis against... Uh, Tito Santana and the Killer Bees, I believe, was the match. They don't talk about that. They talk about Hulk Hogan against Andre the Giant, and they talk about Randy Savage and Ricky Steamboat. So you can have a couple of matches on that show that over-deliver, and that will live on. And that could be what people remember, even with a weaker undercard. 
it's still possible that that you know could could end up being what happens. So we'll see. But as far as this match is concerned, this I thought was the best piece of promotion they've done yet for the Wembley show. Easily. So then, <clears throat> unfortunately, I guess we have to talk about it was Tito and the Bulldogs. Thank you. It was Tito and the Bulldogs. Yeah, the the match that uh, Dynamite Kid had no business being in. I don't know. I don't know how he was able to even be out there with his back in the state that it was in for that match. But again, people don't really uh, they don't really talk about that. Well, actually, you know what? There is one. <laughs> there is one other thing, and people don't really talk about it. But I actually. I'm kind of pissed I didn't remember it. How could I forget? King Kong Bundy squashing Little Beaver. One of the all-time great WrestleMania moments. King Kong Bundy dropping an elbow on Little Beaver. Come on. I'll tell you what. King Kong Bundy dropping an elbow on Little Beaver was a hell of a lot better than what we got next. It was the Texas Chainsaw Massacre death match. Jeff Jarrett and Jeff Hardy. A match that we have not seen since 2011. In TNA. The same year, I believe, of the infamous Victory Road pay-per-view, where it was Jeff Hardy in the main event against Sting, and we all know how that turned out. So we didn't know the rules of a Texas Chainsaw Massacre death match. We just knew that it was a gimmick match, and there would be no rules, and there would be plenty of insanity. Jeff Hardy comes out, and he makes his way down to the ring and then into the crowd right away goes into the crowd, and he goes to the back, makes his way into a concourse area where there's a bunch of weapons hanging up on the wall under an orange light. The bell rings just as Jeff Jarrett runs in with a strap to attack Jeff. Jarrett continues to attack Hardy through the hallway. In comes Satnam Singh, who is wearing overalls to choke out Hardy. Well, now here comes Ethan Page and Matt Hardy, who uh, actually is allowed on this show. He's not banned from Collision like many of you are now with that new uh, Super Chat. Matt Hardy shows up. Isaiah Cassidy shows up to attack Satnam Singh. Matt pours some blood on Jarrett. Jeff Hardy is back now with a crutch to chase Jarrett and Karen through the hallway. Jarrett is just covered in, in fake blood. Karen is screaming that they, they have to hide as they go to commercial. Come back live, and they show everybody very calmly walking up some steps towards the stage. Karen had a fake bone in her hand. She hops on the uh, back of Isaiah Cassidy. There's a also a fog machine underneath the ring. Sanjay Dutt is beating down Ethan Page. Matt Hardy sends Jay Lethal into the barricade. So now we get into the ring. Jeff Hardy has a kendo stick. He attacks Jarrett with it until Ethan Page, Isaiah Cassidy, and Matt Hardy come into the ring. All four of them now take turns beating up Jeff Jarrett. Hardy hits a twist of fate. He lays Jarrett on top of a table. Sanjay Dutt, Jay Lethal, and Karen, they pull start pulling people out of the ring. But Jeff Hardy still goes up to the top rope, and he hits a swanton bomb off the top. Through the table. The table did not break instantly. So that looked like a rough bump. But then the table did finally break. He went for the cover. He got a one. He got a two. Jay Lethal broke things up. Ethan Page looked to finish off Jay Lethal, but Sanjay cut him off. Matt Hardy is in. Twist the fate to Jay Lethal. He tried the same with Sanjay Dutt, but Karen hits a low blow. I'm wondering, what am I doing with my life here, sitting here watching this match? Jared has the guitar, but he gets a kick from Jeff. Now he has the guitar, and he smacks Jared over the head with it. And this is where we heard the sound of a chainsaw. And I was wondering if uh, Terry Funk was going to be joining us on this show. Shout out to Terry Funk. Hopefully he is uh, doing well, wherever he may be. I certainly hope he wasn't spending his uh, his days watching this match. We hear a chainsaw, and here comes Leatherface. I would love to know, by the way, who was under... Well, I wouldn't be surprised if it was like Mark Sterling. I bet you want to bet it was Smart Mark in the suit under the uh, Leatherface mask here. 
But here he comes. Here comes Leatherface. And he is swinging a chainsaw down the ramp. He stops at the bottom of the ramp. And he kicks Sanjay Dutt. And then he stalks Karen Jarrett up the ramp. And she's backing away you know, like something out of a movie. Like one of those uh, ditzes in the movie who uh, trips over herself. Oh no! Don't kill me! As she's trying to back up the ramp. So Jeff Hardy turns around. And we're in the ring now. That, that was the extent to which uh, Leatherface stuck around. Thankfully, he, uh, he at least he wasn't out there for too long. But back in the ring, Jeff Hardy turns around. Satnam Singh is waiting for him. He grabs him by the throat, goes for a choke slam, but no. He kicks Satnam Singh. Jay Lethal, though, with a hammer to the head. Now Satnam Singh goozles him, hits a choke slam to Jeff Hardy. Lethal pulls Jarrett on top of Hardy, and he gets the one, two, three. And Jeff Jarrett has won the Texas Chainsaw Massacre Deathmatch. He celebrated with a, a championship belt that actually had Leatherface on the front of it. It had Leatherface on the center plate. So now we have another championship here in this company. We have the Owen Hart belts, which never get defended. Now we have a Texas Chainsaw Massacre belt. This was a complete shit show. I hope the money was good that Tony Khan made off of this promotion. I certainly hope it was worth it because this was the worst match in Dynamite history. And again, I will say, I am not against sports entertainment. I am against bad sports entertainment. There was nothing good about any of this. This sucked. This was terrible. But why am I watching Jeff Jarrett against Jeff Hardy on this show? Think of all the talent they have on this show that isn't even getting television time. We're less than two weeks away from Wembley Stadium, the biggest show in the history of this company, and we're getting reports about talent being frustrated. They don't know what's going on with All In and the promotion for the show. No one is telling them anything. They don't even know if they're going to be on the show. They probably will be on the show. They'll be stuffed in a battle royal, but they don't know what's going on. And we're watching Jeff Jarrett against Jeff Hardy on dynamite? Really? This is what we're watching here? Less than two weeks away from all in. This is what we're watching here. It's embarrassing. But then, from this point on, it never recovered. The show never recovered at this point. We had Britt Baker, one on one with the bunny. This was to determine the fourth and final spot in the women's championship match at Wembley Stadium. We already know that Hikaru Shida is the champion. We know Tony Storm got a buy into the match. And we know Soraya beat Sky Blue on television on Friday on Rampage to earn the third spot. So this was to determine the fourth spot. Now, if you actually believe that the bunny was going to qualify, then you might want to just turn the television off and don't even bother watching wrestling. I don't know, then you're clearly not even paying attention. I said this the other day. There was a better chance of an actual bunny qualifying and being in the women's championship match at all in. I don't know why we had to go through this whole song and dance with these qualifying matches. If you're going to put together qualifying matches, make them competitive. If you're going to put together a qualifying match, make it at least somewhat debatable about who might come out on the winning end of it. They didn't even try. Britt Baker was wearing her ring jacket from the first All-In back in 2018. They shook hands to start, quickly though devolved into shoving and forearms. The bunny countered into a lockjaw attempt with a cradle for a near fall. Or countered a lockjaw attempt, I think that's what I said. Bunny hit a clothesline, got a pretty good reaction from the crowd for that. After a split-screen break, which is where most of this match took place, Britt Baker hit a double underhook suplex, got a near fall. After some failed interference from Penelope Ford outside of the ring, Baker hit a super kick and a stomp to earn the final spot in the women's championship match at All In. So, again, th these qualifiers were an absolute waste of time. Soraya against Sky Blue on Friday. Britt Baker against The Bunny on Wednesday. Why even bother?
they could have just announced the four-way match. I know they don't do rankings anymore, but they could have just announced the four-way match. Had a couple of singles matches involving some of the people that are in the four-way. I was going to say tag team, but we don't need that. We don't need the can you coexist tag team match. But really, I mean, this, this was just a waste of time, is what this was. Even Sky Blue's mother knew that she had no chance of winning that match. You know how much money she put down against her daughter through DraftKings? Yeah, she was betting against her, believe me. So Sheeta's going to defend her title against those three. Sheeta, I said I had some Sheeta news. Shout out to uh, SEScoops.com. Hikaru Shida did an interview with Ella J of SE Scoops. And she was asked about the person that she is most eager to get into the ring with. Who is the one opponent that she really wants to get in the ring and work with? And without any hesitation, she really named Athena. Named Athena. And I really liked hearing that because I've been an advocate for getting Athena back on AEW television. Athena has had this great run as the Ring of Honor Women's World Champion. But she has been on Ring of Honor television now for, for long enough, and she's run through everybody, including Willow Nightingale. She's ran through all of these people. And the women's division in AEW could really use a nice jolt. And you know what could give them a nice jolt? Moving Athena from Ring of Honor to AEW. And Sheeta said she wants a champion against champion match. She wants to get into the ring with Athena. I say give her what she wants. I, I love that idea. I think that's a fantastic idea. So the sooner they can get Athena on AEW television, I mean, look, they could do champion against champion. I would rather her leave Ring of Honor behind and just get her back in AEW and start building her up there. And then you could do Sheeta and Athena for the championship. A sad Roddy Strong, who is still very sad. You are now banned from Collision. Thank you for the seven bucks. So Sheeta and Athena is a match I could get behind. And I even like the idea of feuding them and having Athena win the championship eventually, like months from now. Winning the women's championship. And when Jamie Hayter is ready to come back, you've got Jamie Hayter and Athena all lined up at some point in 2024, to get to your primary feud for the AEW Women's World Championship. That's what I'd like to see. Now, somebody in the chat mentioned the uh, Maui Food Bank, and I do want to mention that because this was a Fight for the Fallen edition of Dynamite. And so proceeds from all of the AEW shows this week are being donated to the uh, uh, Hawaii uh, Wildfire funds and various causes. So I don't know if the promotional money that Tony Khan would have made from the Texas Chainsaw Massacre match would be going towards that as well. I would imagine it probably would. And I think that's a great thing. You know, I, I praised Tony Khan the other day for that. I think that's a wonderful thing that he's doing. It doesn't change the fact that that was the worst match in Dynamite history. <laughs> Both of those things can be true. You can praise AEW and Tony Khan for doing a great thing. And it, again, I don't know. I don't know if, if the money from that promotion is part of what's also going to that. I would imagine it is, but I don't know. I just Somebody mentioned that in the chat, and I wanted to mention that. So that's a terrific thing. It's a wonderful thing. All the shows this week, including Rampage and Collision, are Fight for the Fallen episodes. But it doesn't change the fact that it sucked. It does not make it okay. So, again, I don't, I don't want people to say, well, you know, at least it was all for a good cause, so it's okay. No, the match was not okay. <laughs> but I, I, am, I am absolutely elated that he's doing a wonderful thing. I think that's fantastic. And he, uh, he, deserves, he deserves recognition for that. Although I don't think he's doing it for recognition. We had the acclaim. This was not given much time. It was already a almost a quarter to ten, so I knew this wasn't going to last very long. But we had the acclaimed against uh, two enhancement guys. I didn't get their names. I don't even know if they gave their names. So Max Caster is rapping on his way to the ring. He dropped the line in there about their bald opponents looking like hairy penises. 
I told you, it was all downhill from here. We went from the Texas Chainsaw Massacre death match to a Britt Baker match with the bunny to a couple of bald penises. The lights went out in the building. When they turned back on, the hairy penises, I guess, had experienced some shrinkage because they had disappeared. And we couldn't see them anymore. Instead, they were replaced by the House of Black. Malachi Black, Brody King, Buddy Matthews, and Julia Hart. King and Matthews attacked Castor and Bowens. Malachi Black and Julia Hart just watched. They used a chain as a weapon. Castor ended up bleeding from the forehead. Buddy Matthews stomped Castor. So back-to-back -back segments with stomps. Julia Hart picked up Billy Gunn's boots, which the acclaimed had been bringing out with them for their matches ever since uh, Billy Gunn left them in the middle of the ring. And uh, she passed them on to Brody King. He gave them to Malachi Black, and they held up Billy's boots. And that was it. That was the segment. You know, a few weeks ago, Andrade went on social media and said that he wanted a singles match with Malachi Black at Wembley Stadium. We're now less than two weeks away from All In, and uh, we have not gotten any sort of uh, clarity on whether or not Andrade will even be on the show. See, Andrade made a very big mistake. Andrade asked for a singles match. That's not the way to get through to Tony Khan. Had Andrade requested a multi-man match, I think he would have gotten his match by now. See, that was his mistake. That was his fatal flaw. He asked for a singles match. Can't do that. Main event saw the Young Bucks taking on the guns. So, uh, two brother tag teams here. The Bucks jumped the guns on the stage as they made their way out and uh, fought them to the ring. Bucks were all fired up because of what Bullet Club Gold had done to Kenny Omega earlier. The Guns double-team Matt Jackson through the final picture-in-picture -picture break. Coming out of the break, the Guns clotheslined each other. Nick got the hot tag. Buck set up Austin Gunn for the BTE trigger, but Colton Gunn hit a flying clothesline to break it up. Colton broke up a Melter driver attempt. The Guns hit the 310 to Yuma on Matt. Nick broke up the cover with a double stomp off the top rope. Austin Gunn went for an O'Connor roll on Nick Jackson with an assist from his brother. But Matt super kicked Colton. Nick then reversed the roll up, and Matt Jackson helped his brother hold down Austin Gunn for the three count from the floor. The referee didn't see it. So the Bucks get the win. After the match, Juice Robinson and Jay White, they jumped the Bucks. Bullet Club set up Matt Jackson to get his injured arm pilmanized, but FTR's music hit. Because there was no Kenny Omega, and there was no Hangman Page. He was at the hospital. So it was all up to FTR. We heard their music. And of course, all the heels, they turned to face the stage. And when you see that, you know that they're not coming out on stage. And that's exactly what happened. FTR came out from behind. They came out from the crowd. And they made the save. They hit the shatter machine on Juice Robinson. Once the Bucks and FTR uh, got rid of all the members of Bullet Club Gold, the two teams looked like they were setting up to go at it here. It looked like FTR was setting up for a shatter machine to the Bucks, but when the Bucks turned around, FTR just picked up their titles instead. And uh, we got a little face-off between the two teams to close out the show. So again, I have nothing but positive things to say about the MJF Adam Cole stuff. It was easily the best thing on the entire show. The best bit of promotion for All In that we have gotten yet. Uh, we had a bunch of matches made official, including Jericho and Will Ospreay, uh, Stadium Stampede, and we know that it's going to be Omega, Hangman, and Kota Ibushi uh, taking on Takeshita and Bullet Club Gold. So they, they did what they had to do as far as moving those stories along. Even if you're not enamored with all the matches, they at least made more matches official, which they had to do. But again, the Texas Chainsaw thing was just stupid. And the show really just never recovered after that. All the good stuff came in the first half of the show. Which makes it, you know, a good show up to a point. But overall, it was decent. Can't call it a good show with the stuff that we got there in the, in the last uh, hour or so. So, that was the story of uh, Dynamite tonight, unfortunately with the worst match in Dynamite history. People are going to think I'm exaggerating, but it truly was. It truly was uh, fucking terrible. Here's the Twitter poll. Uh, 
hell of a lot closer than these dynamite polls typically are. 52%, this is like a raw poll. 52% thumbs up and 48% thumbs down. That's with a thousand votes in. We got a thousand votes in already, so go ahead and vote at Solomonster on Twitter. What did you think of the Texas Chainsaw Massacre deathmatch? Oh, I would love to know. Well, there's always Collision. Collision has been uh, the best show of the week, typically, on most weeks, so. Collision is usually a palate cleanser with WWE stuff. It'll have to be a palate cleanser with Dynamite as well. This week. Assuming that uh, people are actually allowed into the building. Start off here with Luis. Luis dropped a five dollar super chat on me six hours ago. So dynamite should be better than raw. The raw shit sandwich that we got on Monday with Judgment Day standing strong. Mosquito season is strong here in Long Beach. Okay, well, you're in Long Beach. Lair up. Apparently, you got to deal with mosquitoes. I got we got mosquitoes in New York too. Yeah, Raw, Raw was just a fucking bore on Monday night. <laughs> Raw almost put me to sleep on Monday. Uh, Lady Fire Panda. Facetiously asking, why do you hate CM Punk? You should like CM Punk. It's standing up against the evil elite. Thank you, Fire Panda. Thank you for the uh, gifted membership. Uh, Lakers Pat says, I can see why you're a Mets fan. Mrs. Met is thick. Control yourself. Easy there. Easy there, big fella. Calm down. Look at this guy. He's looking at he's looking at Mrs. Met, a mascot, and he's getting all hot under the collar. This is this is Lakers Pats has sunk to the bottom of the ocean here. He has never been lower in his life. Where he is flirting with Mrs. Met. We gotta take you out. We gotta we gotta take Lakers Pats out to uh, some bars, some clubs. We gotta get him liquored up and looking for actual uh, human beings. The Winston Slip says Samoa Joe is great in the Twisted Metal show. Yeah, I think it's a crime that they're not using his voice. You know, I, I've heard a lot of good things about him in the show as far as his uh, his body acting. He's got a lot of physical charisma on the show, but he's got a great voice. They wanted the celebrity voice, so they went with the other guy, but they should use his voice. It's not, it's it's just not, not the same. You gotta have the guy's voice. Uh, Thomas Colella, so I was wondering which you would rank from worst to best sibling rivalry in wrestling history, the Bellas, Harlem Heat, and the Steiner Brothers. They were all terrible. Harlem Heat never should have feuded. The Steiner Brothers one I barely remember. It was when Scott turned, right, and joined the NWO. The Bellas will be at the bottom of the list no matter what. The, the, the Bellas feud, it died in the womb. So you can pretty much put Harlem Heat and the Steiners wherever you want, but the Bellas are going to be dead last. Uh, Joseph Brooks with the 999. Hey, Joseph, what's going on, man? As crazy as New Jack was, did you know that of all people, he was actually good friends with Eddie Guerrero? He said so in one of his last shoots that he did, and he actually cried in another one, talking about Candido. Well, you know, everybody's got a softer side. That's the softer side of New Jack. Of course, what you didn't know is when the shoot was over and the cameras turned off, he took out a box cutter and he cut the he cut the producer, sliced it right across the face because he just felt like doing it. A shout out to Carlos, who has been a channel member for 21 months. That's why he's got that red skull. Where are my red skulls at? Joseph also says buy or sell on which of the oh wait a minute, Sean Nilsson. Sean Nilsson has been banned from Collision. 
See what you did now? You see what you did now? You pissed them off. Terrible. Terrible, Sean. Now you got to turn around and go back home. Buy or sell on which of these sounds the worst? Roman Reigns having to give up his title due to injury, and Cody wins in a tournament, or Cody winning the Rumble again and then winning it this time? I got a better idea. How about Cody beats Damian Priest to win the Money in the Bank briefcase? Because Finn Balor <clears throat> has suffered several losses now due to the briefcase. Due to uh, Damian Priest trying to help him and it backfires on him. So we end up with Cody and Priest agreeing to put his briefcase up. Since J.D. McDonough did say that you should probably get rid of it. Since it's coming between you guys, it's coming between you and Finn. And Finn accidentally costs him the briefcase. Cody wins the briefcase, waits a few months. Once the Royal Rumble comes and goes, he calls his shot, tells Roman Reigns, I'm challenging you for the championship at WrestleMania. That's how you get Cody on the other show. That way you don't have to have Cody win the Rumble. You could have Gunther win, you could have somebody else win. That would be the best solution. Then you don't have to have back-to-back -back Cody Rumble wins. Hey, Drew Johnson has also been a channel member for 21 months. Says Solomonster is the GOAT. Thank you very much. Drew also one of our Red Skulls. Lucky STRB. Or not, uh, no, I thought that was a B. It's an 8. Lucky Straight. <laughs> I was like, what does that mean, STRB? Lucky straight, Jeff Jarrett being in the Texas Chainsaw Massacre is a reference to a street named Jarrett outside Texas Motor Speedway. And that's supposed to make it okay that we have Jeff Jarrett against Jeff Hardy on this television show? I did not know that, so I, I thank you for that. But uh, that does not make it okay. Jacob Donnelly with the 10 bucks. Thank you, Jacob. Random question, but as a horror fan yourself, would you say the Texas Chainsaw Massacre franchise is worse than Halloween? Both are bad over... Excuse me? Both are bad overall, but Texas Chainsaw felt more unnecessary. Well, for, whoa, whoa, whoa. Hold on a second. I will grant you that there have been some terrible Halloween movies, okay? Especially the one with Buster Rhymes. We'll pretend that one didn't happen. Omar, thank you for the seven bucks. You are hereby banned from Collision. You can take your seat. You're comparing apples and oranges, though, with, with Halloween and the Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Texas Chainsaw Massacre, it's not terrible. It's disturbing. But it's no Halloween. I mean, come on. You're, you're going to compare the two? Come on. You're comparing Michael Myers and Leatherface? Don't, don't even amuse me. Don't even amuse me like Nick Grosso with the 1999. That Texas Chainsaw Deathmatch was a complete joke, and Jeff Hardy looked really stupid getting distracted by a cosplay leather face. After what we saw tonight, is Bullet Club Gold a part of the Don Callis family? I don't think so, no. I mean, <laughs> Bullet Club Gold has become a faction in and of itself, right? Adding the guns. They have four members now. So I don't think we, you're talking like a faction in a faction. Now it's just getting very confusing. I, I don't think I don't think that's the case. I certainly would not have them be a part of the Don Callis family. They could be um, allies of the Don Callis family, but they are not part of the Don Callis family. Justin G for Solo's Liquor Fund after that mess. Hey, Justin, thank you for the 12 bucks. That will go towards my next bottle of Jack, which is almost done. Perfect timing. Tuxedo T Servo with the $7 CM Punk banned from Collision. Brand new Super Chat. You better be on your best behavior, all of you. I'm talking to all of you right now, okay? Because Punk's watching. You say one little thing, he's going to know. 
Tuxedo says the Jarrett Hardy fiasco was as close as I've ever come to turning off Dynamite. That was easily the worst segment or match they have ever done. Austin Runge with the five bucks. Don't know if that match made me more embarrassed to be a fan or a, a wrestling fan or a horror fan. Worst match of the year by far. Chris Jester, that's that first of $300 bombs he dropped on me. Chris, you the man. Brian Musha, had to see this one since it's new CM Punk flexing his muscle. Yes, Brian, you are also officially banned, but hey, you are still welcome on Dynamite. So you will always have a home here. PJ, did you... <laughs> PJ, thank you for the five. Lucky straight. CM Punk snuck into Dynamite dressed as Leatherface. Dr. Bropio. Bro, I banned myself from Collision since they don't air here in Canada Live, bro. Screw the app. It doesn't air live in Canada, really? Not even on a... Uh... Well, yeah, I, I guess it wouldn't. Uh, Noel Mulligan, thank you for the two bucks. Brian Anthony Rivers with the five. Here's to Collision, saving us from this week in wrestling. Justin Logue. You should have gotten Godzilla Look, and everyone, Ninja. It's Samoa Bro. Samoa Bro. It's the brand new Samoa Bro super chat from Carlos Galvan. One of our channel members. Carlos, I'm going to get to your message here in a little bit. That's the other new one, by the way. Samoa Bro. Trill Mexican. Banned from Collision. Thank you for the seven bucks. Thank you very much. Yeah, Godzilla and Ninjas. Boy, you, you mentioned the Ninjas. Now you're taking me back to the fucking Ninjas from the, the pandemic era WWE shows. Oh boy, you're taking me you're taking me back to a bad era. Chris Jester with that second $100 super chat which I read earlier. Apparently he's going to be third row smack dab in the middle at all in. I guess he's uh, traveling in from Minnesota, he says. It's going to be amazing. I'll probably get a little bit of FOMO watching uh, everybody in the crowd there. I thought about it, but I got to be here for you guys. It's going to be a long day next Sunday. Robert Kaplinger, Ace Steel running down the ring, threatening to bite everyone would be scarier and more entertaining than Leatherface. And it would be more true to life. Chris, another $100 super chat. And we talked about the Crusher and Baron earlier on. Baron Von Raschke. What was the first Texas Chainsaw Massacre? Was that 1974? I think 74, right? It was the first one. The original. Kiddo Hudson with the $5. I understand that All Out is AEW's quote-unquote WrestleMania. Would it have been smarter for Tony Khan to brand All In at Wembley as All Out instead? Could have done that. Yeah, he could have done that. But whether he branded it as All Out or not, I mean, even if it was All In, you just, you know, you make All Out the sacrificial lamb. I mean, given the circumstances, you're not going to get any bigger than this. And don't forget, a few weeks after All Out, they've got Grand Slam at Arthur Ashe Stadium. So another big show. And that's not a pay-per-view. But that's only a few weeks later. Maybe three weeks. So that's another big show that he's going to have to book. But yeah, I mean, that could have worked too. You could have had All Out at Wembley Stadium. That would have worked. Chris Jester with the 10 bucks. <laughs> Sorry, all the leaves fell off the money tree. Quite all right, Chris. Very much appreciate the support. Thank you. If I had a hat on, I would tip my cap to you right now. Rizzo, thank you very much. Very kind of you. Says, uh... My opinion with the dirt sheets, broken clock is still right twice a day. Okay, so that, that's what I wanted to clarify. 
some people, uh, apparently Meltzer is always wrong, which is just funny to hear me, you know, when I hear them say that. It's funny to me. But then he's right, but then he'll be wrong again next week all the time, except when he's right. It's confusing. The IWC can be very confusing. Uh, Bender McSimpson. What do I have to do to get a Mercedes Monet and Thunder Rosa match? Uh, you've got to get doctor's clearance for both of them. That's what you need. Rudy Salas, my first super chat, newest member of the GWO. Rudy, everybody say hello to Rudy. Welcome, Rudy. Be nice to him and don't get banned from collision. Rudy, thank you. Big MGM, that horrific Texas Chainsaw Massacre match made me forget how stupid that callous picture reveal twist was. Magician Sapphire with 10. My expectations were very low that Texas Chainsaw match, but holy skid, that was terrible. I felt bad for everyone involved in this mess. The money better be worth it. Uh, P. Troid 11. Call him uh, Petroid. Joker Sting tricking Immortal into thinking he ran Impact because he wore a suit was priceless. See? Someone who appreciates Joker Sting. I think Joker Sting gets too much hate. But see, if I remember the storyline, <clears throat> Sting knew that Hogan was no good. And Hogan was, as he did for most of his career, masquerading as a babyface. And I think Sting was, he went heel, but he really didn't go heel because he was just trying to convince people that Hulk Hogan was bad news. And then he went nuts, right? But I think that was his plot the entire time was to sort of expose Hogan, right? Do I have the story right, if I'm remembering correctly? I think that was the story. Uh, Ed Swaggle says that you should call it either the Tony Tron or the Contron. See, the Contron. Okay, maybe that. That might be what we go with here. The Contron. I like that. Chris Jester with another $20 super job. Another leaf. Another leaf fell off the money tree here. Chris, man. You're overwhelming me tonight. Overwhelming me with love. Uh, we've got Zachariah with that 50 bomb. Shutter Bug Fan donated seven bucks to be banned from Collision. Sunday is his birthday. Well, happy birthday to Shutter Bug Fan. You didn't tell me how old you're going to be. We'll get back to Shutter Bug Fan here as we go up the, up the list here. Zachariah says, do you agree that Soraya should not win the title at Wembley? Tony Khan could still give her the standing O even with the loss, which could break up the outcasts since that group went nowhere. But since Tony Khan doesn't care, Soraya will win for the cheap pop by people. Yeah, I, I don't think Soraya should win. I mean, she, she barely wrestles. She barely wrestles. I'm not sure putting the championship on her that she's suddenly going to be wrestling more often. She shouldn't be. You know, that was never the goal when she first came back. You know, the doctor, her, her doctor said, you know, ease your way back into it. But I, I don't think her wrestling on more of a, uh, you know, they don't really do live events much, but quote unquote on a full-time basis. I don't know that that's uh, good for her health. I don't know that she's ready for that. And frankly, she just is not the person who should be holding the championship. I would keep the belt on Sheeta. And I would either wait for Jamie Hayter to come back. Or I like the idea that Sheeta pitched about working with Athena. I get behind that idea 100%. But just her wrestling at all in that match is an accomplishment because, you know, like Edge and like Daniel Bryan, here's someone who was retired and was told you're never going to be cleared. You know, you're never going to wrestle again. And not only is she wrestling again, but she's going to be in the ring in front of 80,000 people in her home country. So, win or lose, it's a huge moment and a huge accomplishment for her. Her losing does not diminish that in any way. But I don't think that she should be the AEW Women's World Champion. Could I see Tony Khan giving her the belt for the moment? So that she can say that she 
won a championship at Wembley Stadium in her home country in front of 80,000 people? Yes, I could see that. But I would not do that. Chris Jester with the 10 bucks. I went to school with mean Mike Enos. He had a long career from AWA to WCW. In WWE, what stopped him from becoming top tier? Let's get the Destruction Crew in tag team be the booker. F the Beverly Brothers. See, the Beverly Brothers, I, I like the Beverly Brothers just because their finish was brutal. <laughs> the Shaker Heights spike was a brutal finish. There were, there were some uh, job guys. They they hit that move on, and how they didn't break their neck, I'll never know. But that's cool that you went to school with him. Uh, I, I never saw him as being uh, like a top guy world champion. He was never booked that way anyway. But, I mean, he had success in WCW as well. Mean Mike, you know, saw on his own, right? He had, look, I mean, he had a run. He had a run. It might not have been a top guy run, but... I got news for you. Most guys don't have top guy runs. Those spots are very limited. But yeah, go look it up for those of you who don't know. Go, go look up the Shaker Height Spike. We'll see what I'm talking about. Jake Finn. What are the chances of Sammy being a surrogate for Uncle Jerry? Uncle Jerry. <clears throat> Such a waste of Will Ospreay in my opinion. Oh, Uncle Jericho, okay. It's like Uncle Jerry. I don't know what you were talking about. Yeah, you know what? Guevara and Osprey would be a hell of a match too. But uh, sadly, the answer is no. The chances of that are nil. Chris AXC. Blitzkrieg Bop. Or TNT by ACDC. What song should Tony Khan license and who should he give it to? Uh, I don't know who he should give it to, but I would go uh, TNT by ACDC. Sad Roddy Strong with the seven bucks. Wanted to send you this super chat, but now I am banned from collision. Ah, damn it. Damn it. You know, if you would if you would have donated six or eight actually no eight would eight, I think eight would count too basically it's anything from like seven I think to ten that'll ban you from collision but sad Roddy strong I wish I had a way to cheer you up but sadly I don't Chris axc says food for thought have Finn talk priest into putting his money in the bank up against Cody cost him the match now you get Cody to Roman without winning the right. It's like, like there's an echo in here. What's going on here? Although that was 30 minutes ago, so that super chat may have come in after I just talked about it. So I think you and I may be, we may be on the same wavelength here. But no, I, I think there's actually a pretty decent chance of that happening. Uh, Omar, five bucks. Is Brit injured? She moves in slow motion and has a lot of lost muscle mass. Uh, well, she might be injured because if I remember from that All Access show, she had some pretty bad back problems. So I actually do think she has back issues that could be uh, that could have something to do with that. Texas Chainsaw Massacre was bad, even if the money is going to charity like what Tony tweeted. Yeah, I have no issue with that. That's great. Um, but I sat and I watched the match. I kept an open mind and it sucked. <laughs> I don't know how many times I could say it. So uh, Omar, I think Omar agrees with me. But yeah, no, I mean, it, it was terrible. It was fucking awful. It was the worst thing of the entire show. It was the worst thing on Dynamite all year. 27 at 27 says CM's right to ban Hardys after that CM... Uh, HHTK equals I don't know what that means. You're doing math. It's too late for math. 27 to 27, thank you. Yeah, where are I did you know I haven't even checked on the uh on the likes. 581. Oh. The 
goal was 350, guys. We're closing in on 600 likes. Could we get there? Could we get there before we do be the booker? I don't know. We're not that. We're not that far off. 600. Omar again says, also, is there a reason why Andrade, Roosh, and Preston Vance are not feuding with the House of Black for the titles? No. Not really. I certainly don't know why they're not feuding with him for the titles. I don't know why we haven't gotten uh, any sort of announcement about Malachi Black and Andrade for All In or All Out. Still waiting on that. Uh, Booba. That beer chug by Hangman was weak as fuck, to be honest. So now we're going to rate the beer chugging. Hasn't Hangman taken enough stray bullets this week? Must we continue to beat up on this man? Sean Nielsen, thank you for the seven bucks. Omar says, I know CM Punk will ban me for asking this, but what will AEW do next Wednesday when Dynamite and Collision are taped on the same night? Well, they're going to have to beef up security, I guess. Right? They're going to have to have one click on one side of the building and the other click on the other side of the building. Going to have to have extra security. Going to have Atlas security at the show next week. Oz and Glorious, acknowledge my gold skull. It is hereby acknowledged. Really enjoyed the show tonight. The chainsaw match was a hilarious train wreck, and All In is going to be an all time. So says Oz and Glorious. Uh, Carlos, say Salamonster, random question. What was your favorite wrestling action figure growing up? Mine was Dead Man Undertaker. Thanks for the podcasts and take care. That's a good choice. You're talking about the Hasbros, the one with the hat on it. Uh, that was a good one. Believe it or not, I never was able to find a Bret Hart Hasbro. And it always made me very sad. Uh, I did have... That was kind of like the tail end of me with, like, collecting or buying the old action figures. Uh, were the Hasbros. And I still have a bunch of them. Uh, I lost some of them, but I can never find Bret. Never had the Bret Hart Hasbro. But as far as my favorite one... Oh, man, you know, I had the LJNs, too, and I'm, I'm not going to lie. I had the Miss Elizabeth figure, and I always loved... She had this gold skirt, and it had, like, a little Velcro attachment. You can pull the skirt off. I always rather enjoyed that. Hey, Carlos, thank you. That means something is wrong with me. I was a young boy. Young boys do stuff like that. What can I say? Trill Mexican 305. I don't give a damn about CM Punk banning me from Collision. And uh, on the second one, Trill, I don't know. You got to figure it out yourself. I think it's pretty self-explanatory. Drew Johnson says Jack Daniels is the best. Thanks for everything. It is my favorite Jack. Thank you, Drew. Uh, EJ Slamp with the 499. CM Punk will never ban me from Collision. Both grew up in Lockport, and my favorite teacher taught him when he taught at Punk's High School. Shutterbug fan, Sunday is my birthday, and I will have a Jack and Coke for you when I celebrate. Please do. Please. Make sure they don't water it down too much like some bars do. Thanks for the awesome content. Keep up the great work. Shutterbug fan, happy early birthday. I appreciate it very much. Jerry or Jerry, Jerry Licks, Jerry Licks. MJF wins the tag match. Cole loses. It turns on him in the main event. So he turns on him, but they're the Ring of Honor Tag Team Champions. Is that what you're proposing? Because that would that would be problematic. If they won the tag titles, but then they they uh, split them up, that creates a bit of an issue. Uh, Batseed with the 999. Would you say overall Brian Danielson is loving his time in AEW so far with his contract? I would say it's a yes, no pun intended. Well, outside of his uh, broken arm and the hardware that he now has in his arm. Yeah, I'd say he's having a pretty fun time. He gets to work with these people that he wants to work with and have long matches and bleed. Right? That's one of the reasons why he left. Vince McMahon would not let him bleed. 
So I think Danielson is uh, very much enjoying himself. And when he's good and ready, possibly in January, he'll get to work the Tokyo Dome for the first time. I think he's probably looking forward to that just as much. Uh, Retro KOH. Not sure if you pointed it out, but Adam Cole's promo mirrored Austin in the buildup to WrestleMania X7. You know, I didn't notice. I mean, if you're referring to the... I don't know if you're referring to the sit-down interview that Austin and Rock did with Jim Ross when Austin talked about how I need to beat you, I need to beat you more than anything that you could ever imagine. I don't know if that's what you're referring to, but uh, no, I didn't, I didn't pick up on that. Uh, Dr. Bropio, it's not paranoia, it's the Pepsi punked since day one-ish bro. I'm sorry. Why Why is it always Dr. Bropio who apologizes at the end of his super chat? Uh, Luis, dropping 20 bucks on the stream. Boy, Luis has been all over the place tonight. Luis, look at you. Luis is coming out of his shell. We're starting to see more of him. Triple H, make a call to Belmont High School. Oh, make a call to Belmont High School. Yes, that Belmont. Ask Walter Pineda to teach Vincenzo a history lesson. Maybe my history teacher could be a better GM than Scrap Iron Adam Hughes. Okay, well, let's not be giving away your teacher's names here. Shout out to Walter Pineda. Care, care of your pupil, Luis. I think that's the first time that a teacher has been shouted out by name here on one of these streams. Uh, Boots. Punk should put Athena in the women's title match. He should. I think he has the power to do so. Oz and Glorious aren't all the LFI dudes in Mexico right now. They'll be feuding with the acclaimed after Daddy Ass returns it all in and they win the trio's belts. Oz and Glorious did a double drop there. I don't know if he intended to, but thank you, brother. Luis with the two bucks says, Long live the Belmont World Order. What is your boy? You? Is Belmont the school? Is that I always meant to ask you where the Belmont comes from. I didn't think you were a racing fan. So, apparently, that's the school name. I think they should do a reality show around you at Belmont's, at, at, the, uh, at the school. I would watch that. Probably only for one episode, but I would watch that. Omar says, who would be your pick to team up with the Blackpool Combat Club? Yeah, I was trying to think about that. I don't even know. Because they got three spots open. Now, do they bring in people from outside the company? Do they bring in, like, Suzuki? You know, I could see Minoru Suzuki being a partner of theirs in the match. Um, I'm trying to think of who from the company on the heel side doesn't have a match who would fit with the Black Bull Combat Club. You know, I think of guys like Hobbs and stuff, but that doesn't really... That doesn't really work. I mean, that doesn't really fit. So, uh, I don't know. I don't know who teams with them, but Suzuki Suzuki would be uh, one pick. Uh, Retro KOH, that sit-down was the reference. It was the first thing I thought of, but I think it's a red herring. Oz and Glorious, does Mercedes run in and help Soraya win the belt at Wembley? Um, I don't think so, no. I don't know that she's fully healed. I don't know that she's running anywhere. <laughs> I don't know that she should be running on a uh, bad ankle. Nope, oh, Armed Anderson. I'm going to say no. Red Emissary of Darkness says, I suspect the Mighty Don't Kneel will team with the Blackpool Combat Club so we get Zack Sabre Jr. possible. Dr. Bropio, Punk Life, this is basic philonomics. Oh boy, you're, you know, you're really scraping the bottom of the barrel here. What is going on with you? Well, there's a lot of uh, questions, a lot of messages there. I think we got through all of them. 
thank you very much for all of the uh, super chat love. A lot of people now banned from Collision after tonight, but that's okay. You can create an entire roster just based off all the people tonight who are now banned. I'm going to have to create a totally new show for all of you. But the goal for Be the Booker tonight was 350 likes. We have officially crossed the 600 like barrier. Boom. Just like that. And uh, with that being said, let's visit our old friend Phil. It is time to Be the Booker. Ladies and gentlemen, it is now time to Be the Booker. There he is, everybody. After collision the other night, all half a mil Phil. There he is. Be the Booker. Uh, we have made some changes, some updates to be the booker over the past week, especially on the women's side. Made a couple more changes the other day. Got rid of a few people. Got rid of the jailbird who I saw has pled no contest. And is now facing, potentially, up to 25 years behind bars. Let us hope. Let's kick things off here with men's Be the Booker. We begin here with the millennial cowboy, Hangman Adam Page, former AEW world champion. He's been in the news this week. Old Hangman. Look at Richie Rich over oh here dropping gosh. all this money on me. <laughs> hey, I just want you to know, I think you rock. I don't mean the rock, a rock. You rock. Oh, boy. And I just wanted you to know that. He wasn't done yet. He wasn't done yet. He's like, uh, Braun Strowman. I'm not finished with you. Chris Jester with another $100 Super Chat bomb. Yes, indeed. Jester Mania is running wild. So seriously, my son turned me on to you, and I have been listening a long time and never showed my appreciation. This is my receipt. The cream will be at Wembley. We'll try to join the show from the stadium, but I will be really drunk. <laughs> you might get 1K. Time to pack for London. Jester out. Well, Chris, have a safe trip. Enjoy the show. I'm sure you're going to have a... I don't, have you ever been there before? I don't know if you've ever been there before. I haven't. But uh, I wish you safe travels, and I will be keeping an eye out for any signs in the crowd. And again, I can't thank you enough for all the love tonight. It means a lot. So thank you very much. Wild. Absolutely wild. All right, let's see who Hangman is stepping into the ring with. Tony Khan may not book him in a singles match at Wembley, but I will. Hangman Page one-on-one -on -one with The Big Show. <laughs> That is not the match I would book for Wembley Stadium. Captain Insano, maybe. Hangman Page in the big show. I, I'm sorry. I just can't get behind that. Can't do it. JM, channel member for 22 months. He just woke up. Where the hell have you been? Thank you, JM. Let's see here. Women's be the booker. We begin with... The uh, always vivacious Mandy Rose, or as uh, Alba Fire used to call her, Mandy Rose. Good old Mandy. Good to see Mandy. I always liked the way that she would say Mandy's name. Mandy Rose. Making a lot of money on her, I guess not OnlyFans, right? It's some other service. Mandy Rose, one-on-one. -on -one. With Charlotte Flair. How are we feeling about this? Mandy Rose and Charlotte Flair. I'll tell you what. Mandy Rose had a, a very good run as the NXT Women's Champion. Charlotte Flair has not been on such a great run recently. But uh, I will be generous. I know. I know. But I think it has the potential to be good. Not great. But I'll, I'll give it the bell. I'm going to give it the benefit of the doubt. Or maybe I just miss Mandy Rose. Maybe I just miss seeing Mandy on my television. Maybe that's what it is. 
All right, here we go. Well, this makes it a little more interesting now that we know uh, we're tied up. Comes down to this. Tag team be the book. We begin. What is this fucking guy again? <laughs> what is this? The Big Show and Kane. Picking the Big Show twice in the same Be the Booker is just a fail. I mean, I'm sorry. Kane and the Big Show. Why am I seeing Big Show on my screen so much? It's like 2015 all over again. I'm seeing Big Show and Kane. Big Show and Kane against the good bro. Oh, good lord. What a snooze fest. Good lord. The good brothers against the Big Show and Kane. Nothing good about that. The fucking boar is what that is. Well, I'm starting to worry that the women's tag team title curse that I went off on the other day has passed itself over to uh, be the booker. I don't, I don't know what's going on. Uh, Nick Grasso with the 499 says, Since Santana and Ortiz are listed as a tag team on AEW's roster page again, Maybe they return and join the Blackpool Combat Club at All In. Yeah, but would they return as heels though? Because the Blackpool the Blackpool side is the heel side. I don't see them. I don't see them coming back together as heels though. <clears throat> Plus, you still have a third spot to fill. I don't know. I'm not. I'm not expecting that. Juan Ocampo, a channel member for nine months, says he missed the stream because of some YouTubers beefing. What YouTubers are beefing? Says, uh, but what in the Outlaw Mud Show was that? Made the bank addicted drug robber match look good. Well, we know who you've been watching. Thank you, Juan. Chris Jester again with the 10 bucks. Wait, one more. My only disappointment was hoping to go to the race down the hill for the wheel of cheese, but it already happened. The race down the hill for the wheel of cheese. That's not that's definitely not something I would be partaking in. Uh Dr. Bropio. Bro, since I'm banned anyways, and Punk booked this awful Be The Booker, this won't officially count in the records. This is more like filler booking. Is that what, is that what you think I'm doing here? Filler booking? Thunder Force 2000 Charlotte will likely be announcing that she's pregnant after she got misted by Asuka at SummerSlam. Oh, you know what? That's a good point. That's a really good point. She got misted. Now we just have to wait on the announcement. I think you're right. I think you're right. I think we may be having a, a Charlotte pregnancy announcement soon. Maybe that's why Andrade's been missing some shows. He's been busy. And The Rock versus Sting. I miss Mandy Rose in WWE too, for obvious reasons. Fun stream as always. Rock versus Sting, thank you for the $9.99. Very kind of you. I agree. Red Emissary of Darkness, wait, did the mist impregnate Charlotte then? I, I'm starting to think maybe you may be onto something here. You may be onto something. Uh, is there a collision stream on Saturday? Uh, probably not, unless I get back home in time, but I am not going to be here. I'm going to be away on Saturday, so probably not. See, the way I'm treating Collision right now, it's just one of those things where, and the summer is winding down, so maybe things will be a little more stable in September. But uh, trying to make the most of what's left of the summer before it's all over and before I got to put my winter coat back on. So yeah, I will not be here most of the day on Saturday. Besides, I'm, I'm probably banned anyway. Probably banned from Collision. Like all of you. <laughs> See, a sticker. I think you're right. I'm banned from collision. Well, thank you guys, man. You guys, whew, you guys came out in full force tonight. Let me tell you, with all the uh, all the love, all the super chats, and the memberships, 
And Chris, obviously, Chris Jester has been the uh, the big surprise of the night. Chris, thank you again. Would I ever consider writing for a big wrestling company if offered? See, that, that has never really, when you really learn about what's involved and all, all, all the pressure involved and all the nonsense that goes on, things being ripped up and rewritten and stuff. I mean, maybe it's different now, but never really appealed to me. But I don't say never. I don't turn down uh, opportunities until I hear what the opportunity is. So I can't sit here and tell you no. I can tell you it's not something I'm really interested in, but would I say no? It depends. Depends on the offer. I don't close the door. Thank you, guys. Uh, Sunday is going to be episode 822 of the podcast. And so we will, as we always do, go over the news of the week. Lacey Evans is on from WWE. Uh, We'll talk about that. The uh, Tammy Sitch news that broke today and obviously this uh, CM Punk stuff. We'll see what else might come out. Every day it's something different. It's ridiculous, but we will be uh, talking about all of that on Sunday. Juan Ocampo says, like DSP Gaming would say, ban, 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 gone forever. Thank you for the two bucks, brother. Appreciate it. Appreciate all of you. All right. Uh, Be well. Stay safe. Thanks for the love. Let's hope we never see another Texas Chainsaw Massacre death match again. And uh, perhaps the most important thing that before I even forgot, Uh, that I wanted to make sure I told all of you. Wakey, wakey. Now I know it can get lonely down here. So I figured I'd bring you some company. You remember each other, don't you? Commissioner Solomon? Meet Carlos. You know, ever since you've come around, you've been a thorn in my side. Sticking your little nose in my business. Thinking you can make a change that you can do good around here. And the only reason I think that you try to be this noble man is because you've never had a blood on your hands. But that changes today. The only way out of here is if you embrace the monster that lives inside each and every one of us. Solomon, if you want to make it out of here alive, you're going to have to finish what I started. And if you don't, I'm gonna make you watch me tear him apart. And then I'll do the same thing to you. Oh, you got something to say? I'm not gonna kill anybody. How would I even do that? Good question. We're not dying down here. Somebody will come for us. We'll be okay. You really think someone's coming for us? You're really stupid, huh, me, though? What's your beef with me? I'm not the one who put you down here. My beef with you? You ain't put me in here. But you damn sure are the reason why I am here. What are you talking about? If it wasn't for you sticking your nose in our business, none of this would be happening right now. What did you want me to do? Get the officials involved? You think they would have helped you? Or better yet, maybe I should call Hog PD. I hate to break it to you. She don't have many friends. 
you got a long list of enemies. I enjoy company of enemies more. So you're just gonna let Mason win? What did I tell you? Shut up! You know, you're the reason why he's been crowned jewel champion for over a year. You're the one who did all the heavy lifting. You're the muscle. You're the reason why he's had all that success. Shut the fuck up! You know, it's a real shame. You're probably the only person on the planet who can actually put a stop to all this and beat him. And instead, you're just content to lay down like a bitch. Cabron. And cabron eres tú. Let me free so I can remind you what it is I do. That's what I like to hear. Easy, 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 calm down, calm down. Do you know what I can do right now? I know, I know, <gasps> I know. You know what though? The enemy of my enemy is my friend. I think the two of us can help each other out. First, we just need to find our way out of here. Let's get to work.